Good morning, class. How is everybody today? <clears throat> Did you have a good weekend? Good. So, um, I don't believe I have any announcements to make. Assignment, but do, uh, assignment one was due on uh, Sunday, right? Yeah, good. Um, so assignment two will be the thing that you want to be working on now. Then. So we should uh, we should gotta gotta move on then because we gotta recover a raise. So um, just a couple more points if I can uh, get if I can avoid becoming delayed too awful bad with. Uh, irrelevant details about uh, numerical representations, which are nonetheless fascinating. Um, so, last time we were talking about the various types of types that you can define. We talked about type definitions, type defs. There you go. Whereby you can declare custom type synonyms. Now let's talk about enumerations. So, an enumeration allows you to define several sort of type literals and assign them to a particular type. So in this particular case, uh, in an example that may be familiar to some of you, we have Pokemon status. Pokemon may have any of the following statuses. These are the visible rather than the invisible statuses, uh, for those of you who are very into the, into the game. Um, confusion does not appear on this list, for example. Um, so not only does this make the type available, but the enumerants may also be used as literals. So, for example, this allows something like the following piece of code to be written. We declare a variable, stat, uh, give it uh, the none uh, enumerat, right? If stat is equal to poison, hit points is equal to hit points, uh, minus 1 16th of hit points. If hit points are less than or equal to zero, status is equal to fainted, etc. stuff like that. So underneath the hood, all it's doing, right, is it's saying, okay, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six in binary. So when it's performing equality comparison, it's not comparing the characters of the literal's name. It's, connect, it's comparing the actual integer representations underlying this. Make sense? That makes it fast, because comparing strings is very slow. Um, question? So it starts off counting by 1 and not by 0? I believe it starts off at 0. Oh. Did, I, did I say? You said 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Oh. But I ended at 6, and I have 7 elements. Oh. So I must have started at 0, no? Oh, I just Maybe. Questions? These are very these enumerations are very useful once again for making your code easier to read and understand and interpret. Right? They're um, primarily for readability. If you wanted, you could you know put in comments somewhere you know condition x is equal to one, condition two is equal to yeah, condition y is equal to two and you could just carry that convention through yourself in your code. Or you could get the computer to do the work for you while you get to uh, pretend that you're a little bit closer to writing English, um, which, you know, most beginning programmers anyway seem to want to pretend they're writing English, so. Any questions? Okay. So, yes. In reality, each of the enumerations is an alias for a bit value. We can expose these using the following program. So if you really want to, you can interpret these as integers and see what the underlying integer representation is. Uh, but because we must move swiftly forward, I will leave that as an exercise to the reader. Just like type defs, the main purpose of enumerations is code readability. So. So let's talk about variable scope. The scope of an identifier denotes what parts of a program that identifier is accessible in. Level of scope, uh, levels of, of scope are often called either contexts or namespaces. Namespaces is actually borrowed from 
C++ terminology. We are often taught that scopes can be local or global, depending on whether the identifier is available only when written within a particular function, local, or throughout the whole program, global. Uh, this is actually a fallacy. This is a grammar-based understanding of scope, since we can tell the scope of something by looking at, its pro at the program's structure. Um, it is more correct to think of there being several layers of scope and the local being only the, the uh, top level in the, uh, in the function call stack, but you know, I, I've been through that a couple of times now. So, note that public and private objects are object-oriented, um, sorry, public and private objects in object-oriented programming are a related concept, concept, but they are distinct from this concept of global versus private. Does anybody know what public and private, uh, sorry, global and local, anybody know what public and private mean? You, sir. Uh, in, well, when I did Java, encapsulating private was, it can be accessed outside of what the function is in, so like wherever it is, and public can be accessed directly up to the parent class. Perfect. So I like the word that you used in encapsulation. So when you have something that's private, it's only accessible to other elements of the same class, be that, you know, normally methods or functions, member functions. Um, anything that's public is accessible outside of the class. So, you know, that's generally considered your interface with the class, right? Um, but again, this is not, of course, an object-oriented program. So, a better way to think about scope is to think about how the call stack works. The top level frame in the call stack is the local context for that pro the program that is currently being executed. Functions are here considered programs. This is the most local context. The reason local variables are not accessed in a more global context is that they are deallocated before program control returns to the calling program. This is why local context can access local um, other local contexts, but not vice versa. Let's see here. I'm going to get my little clicker box on. Left, right. So, okay, good. <clears throat> C allows you to select which region of the computer's memory you wish to store a variable in. We have four storage specifiers, auto, extern, static, and register. Register is only a suggestion. This changes the, um, changes the place in which the, uh, the variable is being stored, right? So auto or automatic variables are variables in the regular sense. So as you have been using variables so far, so auto variables are. Same semantics, because the auto keyword is optional and implied if absent, right? External variables are stored in the quote unquote data segment, also sometimes known as heap memory. Same as static variables. They are actually initialized to zero. Um, external variables, are global across multiple files, static variables are still scoped to within a single block. But both have a lifespan until the end of the program. So, external variables are what you might think of as true global variables. Right? Static variables are variables which will hold their value between different calls to the same function but cannot be viewed outside of that function. <coughs> that a static variable, um, bit here you might consider the uh, public-private distinction to come into play. You can think of static variables as being private to the functions they, uh, they are contained in, uh, even though you know, in object-oriented languages, privacy applies to objects, not, not methods, but you know, so it goes. Depends on the language, I suppose. External can be thought of as public global variables. 
and therefore the most dangerous. Um, external variables in C apply to many source code files, as many as you're currently compiling. Uh, the reason for this, of course, is that C dumps everything into one file and then processes the whole thing. So, you know, uh, once you get a certain depth into the compiler, the idea that your C program might be spread across multiple files is, you know, ephemeral at best, shall we say. Um, at any rate, automatic variables, because they're stored in the system call stack, are deallocated um, at the end of the uh, lifespan of the function wherein they are declared. And uh, the same goes for register variables. So register is kind of an interesting one. Um, register variables are essentially automatic variables, except you are suggesting to the compiler that they be stored in register memory inside the CPU itself, rather than being stored in RAM. If it's not possible to do that, then the compiler won't. Again, it's a suggestion. A great deal, well, one of the various optimizations that you can perform uh, using the C compiler is allowing GCC to decide which of your variables should be register variables and which ones shouldn't. Remember that re register memory has the fastest access time of any form of memory, right? So if you have a very frequently modified or used variable, storing it in register memory can increase the speed of your program uh, because you don't have to perform a lot of redundant fetch load, you know, load store operations communicating with the RAM. And RAM is slower than CPU memory at any rate. So, yeah, uh, but again, if you have asked for 32 register variables and your CPU only supports 16 registers, some of which are used, you know, for other purposes, uh, C reserves the right to say, you're stupid, don't, don't do that. I'll let you pretend that's a ver register variable, basically. Any questions? So, in order to use these keywords, you just put them in front of the data type that you're declaring in the same way that you would make an integer a long integer, right? You can have an external long, long unsigned integer. So you can see why type defs exist, right? <laughs> to shorten that. So, quickly explain. Auto explicitly declares a variable to use default scoping rules. As such, auto, the auto keyword is rarely, if ever, used. Um, I don't know why you would ever actually explicitly use auto because it defaults to it. Extern declares a variable as having global scope. Implicit when the variable declaration is outside of all functions in a C file. So, in the same way that you might uh, declare a variable as belonging to a class in Java by placing it outside of any method in that class, uh, if you put it, a variable declaration outside of any function in a C file, that makes it automatically an external variable. Make sense? Um, once again, use of global variables is discouraged whenever possible. It is the number of situations where use of a global variable constitutes good coding practice is very small in comparison to the number of times people seem to want to use them. <clears throat> it's not that there's no legitimate use of a global variable, it's that people use them as a crutch to cover for bad coding. Um, so, static visibility rules from auto combined with data persistence from external visible only inside of the block that it is declared in, but the variable's value is persistent between different executions of the same function. One very useful use of static variables is to count how many times a function has been executed. Right? So you kind of have the, the best of both worlds. You have data persistence, should that be necessary, but you also have inaccessibility outside of the function, so you don't have to get into the muddy waters of true global variableism. So, 
registers follow local scoping rules, basically auto variables, suggests that the compiler place the variable in register memory rather than RAM, the compiler has the right to say no. But uh, it can use this sort of optimization if you ask nicely uh, using the O3 flag. There are a couple of flags that you can uh, use on GCC to improve optimization. There are some optimation, optima optimization subroutines which you can enable. Um, o, like uh, large capital O, level 1, 2, or 3. Um, you can optimize for area, like uh, you can optimize for uh, program length, you can optimize for memory usage. There are a number of options. O3 optimization is better in general than anything anybody but an expert C programmer would be able to use. So, very, very good optimizations. Much, much, much good. Um, <clears throat> however, O3 optimization take very long time to compile, especially for a large program. So use at your own risk. Well, at the risk of your own time, anyway. So, Let's talk about recursion. So this is a new concept probably for most people in this class. How many people have heard of recursion? How many people have heard of recursion because I mentioned it last week? <laughs> how many people actually know how recursion works? Okay, that's not terrible, but the rest of you, that's, that's maybe like 30, 40% of the class. Let's get you up with recursion. So. If you already know what recursion is, just remember the answer. Otherwise, find someone who is standing closer to Douglas Hofstadter than you are, then ask him or her what recursion is. So that is a recursive algorithm to define recursion, right? Uh, because if everybody does this, then you eventually, someone will ask the guy who knows what recursion is, Douglas Hofstadter, and then he'll tell them, and then they'll pass that back up the chain, and then you'll know eventually. This is how recursion works. So, <clears throat> recursive algorithms are a class of, method, uh, class of methods for solving problems where the solution depends on smaller solution, uh, the solutions to smaller instances of the same problem. So, basically, if you take some problem, and you can express that problem in terms of smaller instances of the same problem, plus one instance where you don't have to do that. That is what we call an inductive structure. So, this is a very, very, these are two very classical inductively defined functions, right? So, the factorial, right? You guys know factorial from, uh, from high school, I hope. So the factorial is all of the numbers, you know, 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times 5, etc., all the way up to n, right? You can define that inductively by saying that n factorial is equal to n times n minus 1 factorial for n greater than or equal to 1 and 1 for n equals 0. This definition requires the use of the factorial definition inside of itself, right? In, uh, in normal intellectual spheres and normal intellectual disciplines, this would be considered the height of bad manners because you are producing essentially a circular definition, right? It's like, uh, you know, um, It's like, uh, you know, Canada is the country which is Canada, right? It's like, okay, but what is Canada? Canada is the country which is Canada. Okay, but what is Canada? Etc. Etc. The thing that makes this not bad reasoning is this guy right here, the base case. So the idea is that, you know, assuming that this n is a uh, member of the set of natural numbers, if you take any natural number and subtract one from it long enough, you will eventually arrive at zero, right? That is one of the properties of the natural numbers. So this definition then has a limit. It's not just an infinitely recurring sequence of definitions of itself, right? 
there is one point at which it will be defined utterly, purely in terms of a, an, actual, an actual literal. There we go. Boom. Right? Make sense? <clears throat> Similarly, uh, the well-beloved Fibonacci sequence, each element of the Fibonacci sequence is the sum of the two previous elements of the Fibonacci sequence except for the first two, right? Where the first two are both defined as being one. This, by the way, is logical or. Um, so, because this Fibonacci sequence is defined by itself, it is also a recursive algorithm, but one of a different nature or at least the algorithm to calculate it would be recursive. It's different in nature from the factorial, because it requires two calls to Fibonacci for every one call, uh, you know, for every one call to Fibonacci, two, are, two more are spawned, right? So, basically what that means is that the runtime of this algorithm is very, very bad. Like, it's, 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 it's terrible. Um, do you use it, using a naive implementation of the Fibonacci sequence, um, it would be impossible to calculate num uh, more than like the 50th Fibonacci number for most people, unless you want to wait a couple of months. Um, and I mean that in a very, in a very literal sense. Uh, because, you know, basically, uh, what is People now are racing their bloody asses. I am. A pox upon them! So, basically, the number of Fibonacci calls that you have to make is proportional to 2 to the power of n, where n is the number that you're supposed to be calculating, right? So, you know, if n is, if n is, you know, 1, that's 2, 2, 4, 3, 8, 4, 16, that gets very, very large very quickly. By the time you're hitting, um, you know, 2 to the power of 50, you're starting to hit numbers that don't fit inside, you know, well, 2 to the 64 will fit inside of a long, long integer, right? But the amount of time it would take to process all of those numbers is extremely long, right? Um, you can easily hit uh, numbers which are, you know, assuming that you're processing like several, but, but it, like if you're processing a billion cases a second, um, to process, well, I actually have a chart in another course which might be interesting. Give me two seconds. I know, I know, I know, I know. It's interesting though. Processing, you know, 50 elements, it might take 36 years, right? To process, to find the 100 Fibonacci um, uh, number might take 10 to the power of 17 years. And you can tell by the fact that uh, 10 to the 25 years is on there that very long is in very long indeed, right? Like 10 to the 17 years is. Like, if you had, if you have the, like, the, the duration of the universe so far in seconds, right, and assuming that the universe actually is a simulation, 
just, you know, for the sake of argument. We stop the simulation right now, rerun it once for every second that it's elapsed so far, and then we do that recursively a couple more times. That's how much time we're talking about, right? So uh, it's very, very possible to write algorithms that will, that, like, can theoretically be computed, but cannot practically be computed, right? Cool. So anyway, <clears throat> recursive functions generally have an iterative case and a base case. In the previous slide, this is the iterative case, this is the base case. Yeah? So, the iterative case makes the decision, performs an operation, or in some way modifies the data passed into the function, and calls the function again with modified inputs. From a top-level perspective, the iterative case is the case that iterates. It is the one that contains the recursive call. The input of subsequent function calls should travel in the direction of the base case. So in both of these cases, despite the fact that Fibonacci will take an awfully long time, it is still reducing, right? Assuming n is a natural number, we are still making progress towards the base case, uh, no matter how long it takes us to get there, right? If you had a situation where this was a plus, like fib n plus 1, and our base case was 10 equals 1 or 0, then this would be what we call infinite recursion. So in the same way that one of the pitfalls of loops is that you can get an infinite loop, and that's a problem, in the same way, when you have recursive algorithms, you can get infinite recursion, and that's also a problem. It's a little bit, it's, it's, not as, it's not as easy, though, to get infinite recursion as it is with loops, in my opinion, but so it does. So, the base case does not require the function call to call itself to return a value. Without a base case, your recursive function will call itself forever. There are programming languages, such as Haskell, that use recursion exclusively as a replacement for loops. Uh, if you, you know, you've probably heard me mention Haskell a couple of times. Haskell doesn't even have the concept of a loop. All it uses is recursion for everything. So, you can imagine that its function calls are very efficient in that case. Any questions? Good. So, recursion examples. Very simple, like, if you take a look at these algorithms, they are very direct interpretations of the uh, mathematical equations we saw on the previous slide, right? Except with these little case statements here, we translate those into if statements. The iterative case contains a recursive call to the same function, right? And uh, that's all she wrote, right? It's actually reasonably simple to implement these from mathematical equations, right? Clean, simple, easy to understand. Same thing with the Fibonacci sequence. If n is 0 or 1, we return 1. Otherwise, we return Fibonacci n minus 1 plus Fibonacci n minus 2. Make sense? Any questions? Yes? So would each call of the function be a different stack? Yes. Each call, so in C at least, there are some languages where function calls don't mean the same thing, like Haskell. That's why Haskell uses recursion for everything, because it's not going to destroy the stack by doing so. But that is the problem with recursion in C. You have a tendency towards stack overflow if your recursion is too deep. Now, you know, In the case, like, these things don't have to be, like, the recursion itself doesn't have to be that deep um, in order for the runtime to explode ridiculously. This uh, Fibonacci algorithm, the maximum depth of this recursion tree 
is actually equal to the number that you start off with. So, you know, if we have 50, you know, space for 50 function calls on function call stack, then we can use the Fibonacci algorithm to, you know, take 36 years to process that, right? Uh, because it'll just be going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, right? Uh, it doesn't have to always stack down. Does that make sense? Okay, good. So, in C, all of our function calls are going straight onto the system call stack. If recursion depth is too great, you can... I, how often do I just say the thing that's on the next slide? <laughs> My god, maybe it's useful to have said it twice, I don't know. I hope it doesn't make the class boring. If the recursion depth is too great, you can easily cause, cause stack overflow. This is particularly true of recursions like Fibonacci, which call themselves twice. It depends, you know. Basically, the number that goes in is the depth, right? So if the if n is too great, you will hit stack overflow, though you may not hit it for you know <clears throat> many thousands of years. Everything a loop can do, recursion can do, and vice versa. So this is an interesting little concept. Um, do you guys, are you guys aware of the concept of Turing completeness? Never heard of it? You know who Alan Turing is? Hopefully. Anybody not know who Alan Turing is? Okay, so um, go watch the imitation game. And uh, I won't ask you to write an essay on it. But um, <clears throat> Alan Turing is he occupies the same position within the field of computer science that someone like Newton or Einstein would in physics. That's the, val that's the degree of his value of, the con of contribution to the field. Um, he was the first, uh, one of the first to come up with a uh, workable model uh, whereby an electronic computing device could be devised in a mathematically rigorous fashion. So um, I won't get into it, but it's called the Turing machine. One of his very important mathematical results is that um, essentially anything that can be computed can be computed using any means of computation. Means of computation is interchangeable. So the way that applies to programming languages, if you have a language which is Turing complete, this is like a property of the language is that it's Turing complete. It means that any program which you can write in that language can be written in some manner in any other Turing complete language. So any C program can be written in Java, can be written in Haskell, can be written in TypeScript, can be written in frigging HTML. Because it, using some of the more advanced features, HTML is in fact Turing complete. Um, the question, of course, becomes how much of a pain in the ass is it to do so? Uh, there are languages which are good for some things and not good for others. That's the whole purpose of pro that's why there are umpteen gazillion programming languages, because each one is serving a particular niche, right? Um, C's niche, of course, is low-level system-level stuff, right? Which is why you guys need to know it, but, uh, you know, at any rate, um, Recursion and loops perform basically the same uh, class of functionality, and some languages use recursion instead of loops, yet are still Turing complete. Therefore, any C program that you write can be written in Haskell using recursion and no loops at all. Make sense? That's a sort of fundamental results in computer science hour. Um, so, yes. Many useful data structures have recursive definitions, such as trees, heaps, lists, and linked lists. Um, we'll get uh, into these a little bit more when we talk about structs, uh, but uh, for now, um, we move on to our next topic. We're going to talk about arrays.
So, so we're going to talk about arrays. In the course of this discussion of arrays, we will unveil why it is that programming languages use zero indexing on arrays, which may have been a perpetual mystery to all of you, uh, unless you already know about stuff. So, anyway. So in Python, if you all remember Python, hopefully you'll, you're beginning to forget Python now, where good programming thoughts are pushing out all the bad ones. Um, in Python, you have several data structures to choose from. Tuples, lists, dictionaries, sets, and strings. In array, or in C, there is only, sorry, oh my god. In array, there is only C. In C, there is only the array. There is only one type of data structure, right? The only data structure supported natively is the array. If you need something more complicated than an array, you have to either define the li find the library or define it, uh, define it yourself. All right? So most programming languages will talk about arrays and have a good solid concept of what an array is. That concept is based in this, not this understanding of what arrays are. Um, like Java arrays are arrays in the C sense, for example. But um, Python is kind of interesting and unique uh, in the app because it doesn't have, you know, reference. It doesn't make reference to arrays, even though it uses them for sure. So, so what the heck is an array? Why are you bothering me with this so early in the morning? Uh, it's because I have to. An array is a contiguous segment of memory which may be accessed via linear indexing. So, this is very important, right? This is important for your concept of what an array is to understand that it is stored in contiguous memory, right? So, if this is your hard disk, an array is a segment of your hard disk which is continuous. There are no breaks in it, right? You store values in the elements of the array. The array has a starting point in memory, which has a particular memory address, right? You access all of the rest of these elements of the array by adding the index to the memory address. Well, you take the index, multiply it by the bit width, or the byte width of the thing you're trying to get at, or Multiply by the byte width of the things that the array contains. So if it's integers, you multiply by 4 bytes. If it's long integers, you multiply by 8 bytes. You add that to the memory of the, uh, the memory address of the first element of the array, and that gets you that, at that particular, whichever element you're trying to access. So to look things up in an array is a constant time uh, operation. It requires practically no time. Uh, this is in contrast to things like lists, where you actually have to go through each of the elements of the list one by one to find the one that you're looking for. That takes an amount of time proportional to the size of the list. So the longer the list is, the longer it takes to look something up in it. Right? Arrays, it doesn't matter how big the array is, it takes the same amount of time no matter how much, no matter how many elements are in it. That's why arrays are used for everything under the hood, because they're very, very fast. Okay? Right. So, anyway. Um, all elements of an array have to be the same type, because these have to be of consistent width, or else how do you know where you are in the array well, via indexing, right? So, unlike Python, which allows you to mix all kinds of different elements of all kinds of different data types in together in the same data structure, um, uh, arrays are somewhat more fascistic, shall we say, uh, in that they only allow one type of thing to be in them at any given time. Arrays are use zero indexing. This should be something you're familiar with from Python. The size of an array does not change during execution. Arrays are static. So once you declare an array, 
you must know the size of the array that you are declaring ahead of time, and it does not change past the point of its declaration, except through dynamic memory allocation techniques, which we're going to talk about when we talk about pointers. But for now, we are just talking about static arrays. They are of fixed size once declared. Was it something I said? It's like very, very angry about arrays. No! They, they're not good, I don't want to use them. Um, so, this means that the size of the array must be known at the time of declaration. Uh, this is in contrast to Python, which simply allows you to say, this is a list, and I'm just going to add items to it as we go, and that's going to be fine. And it's like, yes, okay, we also have lists in C, but we are, you know, we are real programmers, and therefore we can make our own lists, thank you very much. Um, there are ways of getting around this, but not without knowing about pointers, which we'll talk about pretty soon. Syntax! Come on, I still got six minutes. You don't have to be zipping up your bags just yet. Don't think I hear that? You don't think I hear you zipping up your bags? Um, so, an array is declared in the following manner. See the square braces? That is the only thing that denotes as the integer C from the integer array C. Right? The X here must either be an integer literal or an expression evaluating to an integer. Um, and by integer we mean unsigned integer, a natural number. You cannot define an array with negative, a negative number of elements because that's dumb. This rule applies to array indexing as well as de declaration. So you can have, you know, accept of, you know, array foo, you can access element x plus y. That, that is an expression that works. It will evaluate this and use that result to get to the index it wants, right? In case you didn't know that was possible, that's possible. So, on declaration, an array is filled with smelly junk data. It's filled with smelly garbage. Arrays are not cleared before they are given to you, right? Whatever the system was using that memory for before you asked for the array, it will just keep those values left over in it. You might think that that's a data, data vulnerability, but in fact, data is meaningless in the absence of context. Because the context with the program that was using data has been broken, it's no longer meaningful. It's all like, it's stochastically impossible to figure out what the meaning of that data was. So, they just give it to you. Again, it ha all comes down to runtime. To give you a segment of memory without clearing it is, again, independent of the amount of memory that you're actually allocating. You can just give it one step, you're good, right? To clear the data before it get, gets given to you, you basically have to perform an assignment operation on every single memory element in sequence, setting them all to zero. It takes an amount of time proportional to the amount of memory you've requested, which takes time, especially if you've asked for a lot of memory. So, you know, one step is preferable, so that's why your memory, like if you, if you ask for an array and you just print out the results, you will get random garbage that is random every time. <clears throat> Pardon me. So, um, arrays may be indexed using the array indexing operator, so it's correct to think about square braces as an operator uh, rather than as a variable. Like, don't think about CX7 as being its own variable. Think about that as an array upon which an indexing operation has been performed. This will serve you better once we get into pointers. All right. Make sense? Do I have any questions so far? Can you just repeat that last sentence? Sure. So, um, there can sometimes be a tendency to think about like C at 7 as being a variable, right? Think of an array as like a sequence of variables that you've just like, like sometimes when you're programming, it's like, well, I need like, you know, num1, num2, num3, num4, and then you just, you know, collect collapse up those numbers into like something like that, and that's what an array is. Like it's better to think of 
this array as being its own distinct physical object upon which you are performing an indexing operation. Right? Think of the square braces as being an operation. Make sense? 